On behalf of the Mayflower Church family and staff, I welcome you wherever you might be this morning, streaming in Michigan with family in the kitchen, with a dog in your lap, watching on a desktop computer in Florida, cradling an iPad in California, or listening to our podcast on iTunes during the week, we are delighted that you have joined us. Author and Trappist monk Thomas Merton once wrote this, every person becomes the image of the God he or she adores. She who worship is directed to a dead thing becomes dead. He who loves corruption rots in time. She who loves a shadow becomes herself a shadow. This morning, through the melodies and lyrics of inspiring music, scripture read and proclaimed, and prayer we gather to worship and to adore a God who extends to each of us the wonder, the mystery, and the joy of resurrection the promise of new beginnings, and the reality that life is stronger than death. For as we choose to worship that God, and that God alone, in worship we invite resurrection and new beginnings into our own life. We hope over the past few days and weeks you've been able to connect with us through our Facebook page, which offers, for example, concerts called Mondays at Mayflower. You'll also find Throwback Thursdays where we celebrate joyous events that we have shared as a church family over the past few months. We also have Facebook pages with content for youth and for families contributed by our Faith Formation Journey staff members. And know your staff have been reaching out to members and friends who might be in need of help or can offer help. And if you receive our Friday email, I invite you to locate our worship bulletin or to visit our homepage on our website to download it and to follow along with our order of service and to sing along when you can as you'll find hymns this week at the bottom of the email, to read along with scripture passages as you can and to pray with one voice as we join together this morning as the body of Christ. So let us now prepare our heart, our soul, our mind to come before that which is holy in our world, that which sustains us by grace, the one who surrounds us with steadfast love as we walk together the valleys and the hills of life, experiencing both sorrows and joys. Come and let us worship.
It has been said that prayer is a form of incarnation, a means by which God can be born in each of us anew. Just as Jesus was born of Mary, so as we pray. In many ways, we invite that miracle, that reality, to occur within us. I invite you to join your hearts together with mine in prayer. O oh God, the psalmist writes, I will bless you all my life. In your name I will lift up my hands and my soul shall be filled as with a banquet. Even though we gather in different situations and locations this morning, we know, O oh Lord, we are united in and through the Spirit, that we are one. And we come before you, O Lord, to bless you and to adore you, knowing that whenever we choose to open our lives to your word, to your son's teachings, what is important comes into focus. What is necessary becomes clear. And we can live into the knowledge as we choose to bless you in our lives. You bless and reveal to us the path of abundant life. So may our worship be pleasing in your sight, we pray, as we reflect on events of Easter morning of earthquakes and clothes shimmering like lightning, of empty tombs and Jesus' disciples fearful and unsure exactly what it all means. And then help us, O oh Lord, to consider again how you would have us live as an Easter people, what you would have us do next as we continue to step into the light of your resurrection. Amen. As we reflect on the events of Easter morning, we begin in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. And listen now for God's word. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. 
Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. and struggle for thy part with all thy art. The cross taught all the world to resound his name. Who bore the same? 
stretched sinews taught all strings what key is best to celebrate this most high day. Consort both heart and lute, consort both heart and lute, and twist a song pleasant and long. Oh, since all music is but three parts, void and multiplied, oh, let thy blessed speech The third reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, the lilies have wilted. Our Easter baskets are picked over. Our alleluias are muffled. And yet, as we gather around your word this Sunday after Easter, we still seek your living presence. Teach us to see your resurrection and show us how to live into its blessings. All this we pray in the name of our risen Christ, Amen. Two of our scripture lessons take place on mountaintops. In those days, perhaps not unlike our own, people thought of mountains as places that were closer to God, places of majesty and mystery. Places where God reveals God's self. You may remember Moses climbed Mount Sinai to talk to God. It was there 
that he saw the face of God and then received the Ten Commandments. And it is to the mountaintop that the resurrected Jesus instructed his disciples to meet him one last time. Before ascending into heaven, Jesus gives the disciples a final assignment. Go, make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything I have commanded. And this takes them to another mountain, a place where they remembered what he taught them. Last week, Christians across our globe celebrated Easter. Mayflower members sent pictures of families worshiping on living room couches and around dining room tables. A few of you donned Easter bonnets. Most of you had one hand wrapped around a cup of coffee while the other hand stroked a happy pet. We heard the proclamation, he is risen. And perhaps some of you responded to your screen, he is risen indeed. And though nothing could replace the joy of gathering in this sanctuary with the aroma of lilies, the sounds of trumpets, through streaming and Facebook Live, close to a thousand of us worshiped together last Sunday morning. A week has passed, and though we can see hints of new life around us, it snowed most every day this week in Grand Rapids. Communities are still sheltering in, and the charts show that as a nation, we are still at the top of the curve as COVID-19 spreads across our country. As the story of Easter concludes, we are left with the question, now what? It's not an unfamiliar question. Following the resurrection, each of the Gospels leaves the reader with the same question. Now what? The Gospel of Mark prefers to let the reader sit with that question as it ends with an image of an empty tomb. The Gospel of Luke tells us two disciples met a stranger on the road to Emmaus, and it was through the hearing of Scripture, gathering around a table and breaking bread together, that they came to recognize the stranger as the risen Jesus. The Gospel of John hints at where we might find the risen Jesus as he describes five encounters with Jesus. Mary seeking him in the garden. The disciples afraid and hiding in a room. Doubting Thomas. The disciples having a bad fishing day. And finally, Peter, who needed to know he was forgiven after denying Jesus three times. In Matthew, the disciples are asked to meet Jesus one last time on a mountaintop. They came with their questions, now what? When will we see you again? How will we know you are still alive? In response, Jesus points them to what he taught. And so for the next six weeks until Pentecost, we will explore some of those teachings from the Sermon on the Mount in a series entitled Resurrection Blessings. These teachings may be familiar to you. They are known as the Beatitudes. And though much inspirational wisdom has come from creative word plays on be and attitudes, 
The title actually comes from the Latin word beati, which means happy, rich, or blessed. The late Kurt Vonnegut once said that if you want to discover the meaning and the potential of human life, you might start with the Beatitudes. My preaching professor, Tom Long, suggests the Beatitudes are the preamble for all of Jesus' other teachings. Just as the preamble of the United States Constitution named the virtues our nation stood for that day, justice, tranquility, common defense, general welfare, and liberty. Those same virtues also pointed toward what we hoped our nation would become. It might be helpful for us to understand how Jesus used the word blessed. There are two words for blessed in the New Testament. The first is eulogio, which is used when one gives a personal blessing to another. The most simple version of this is when someone sneezes. We say, bless you. It's a hope, even a prayer, that someone will be blessed. But Jesus uses another word for blessed in the Beatitudes. He uses makarios, which is not a prayer for the future. It's a declaration that recognizes happiness and good fortune that already exists. In other words, each of the blessings in the Beatitudes is both an affirmation of God's presence in that person's life today and a promise for the future. So what does this tell us as people who are standing in the shadows of Easter? How do the Beatitudes answer the questions we voice along with the disciples? Now what? When will we see you again? How will we know that you are still alive? If you scroll down to the bottom of your bulletin or the email you received with the order of service, you will find an image of the Reverend Claudio Del Monte. Perhaps you saw his story last week in the New York Times. He's a 53-year-old priest in Northern Italy. He carries a phone given to him by the staff in the Bergamo Hospital. He carries a small cross and homemade sanitizer. Instead of his usual cleric's collar, he wears disposable scrubs, a surgical mask covered with another mask, protective eyewear, and a cap on his head. On his chest, he drew a black cross with a felt pen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Scholars tell us that the word poor in this verse can also be translated as humble or meek. Now our instinct is to hear these words as passive. They imply a deficit or an insufficiency, but that's not the right tone. Grounded within this phrase is an active, bold sense of depending on God's protection. As one scholar explains, the poor in spirit are those who recognize 
that God is their hope. They are those who know where they fall short and confess their need for God to step forward. Reverend Claudio Del Monte's phone rang. He excused himself from two coronavirus patients he was visiting in a hospital room, and he answered the call. But he already knew what it meant. Minutes later, he arrived at the bedside of an older man he had met a few days earlier. An oxygen mask now obscured the man's face. The ICU staff huddled around his bed. Reverend Del Monte said, I blessed him and I absolved him from his sins. He squeezed my hand tightly and I stayed there with him until his eyes closed. I said the prayer for the dead and then I changed my gloves and continued my round. We stand at the edge of Easter and ask, now what? And Jesus taught, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The second beatitude proclaims, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word mourning here is not the word we use when one grieves the death of a loved one. As one preacher says, a better translation might be, blessed are those who recognize that the world we live in is not the world that God intended. Blessed are those who see the brokenness of human life and of creation and cry out in lament, O oh God, do not let your world hurt this way forever. In northern Italy, Priests like Reverend Del Monte have joined the front line and become symbols of sacrifice against the invisible enemy of the coronavirus. They offer solace through WhatsApp groups. They wave from behind car windows as they bring food to the sick. They lean against door frames of infected bedrooms as they deliver last rites. They shroud themselves with protective equipment as they whisper prayers and encouragement at hospital bedsides. And we ask Jesus, now what? When will we see you again? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The third beatitude is somewhat like the first. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Greek word here for meek is praus, which is defined as Mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, meek. And again, we are inclined to hear this word as passive or perhaps even a justification or an excuse for inaction. But the meaning of the word pros stems from an active strength one that comes from a trust in God's presence and control over the outcome. This same word is used twice to describe Jesus. 
The first time is within an invitation to be yoked, to work alongside of him. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am prous and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. There's an interesting juxtaposition there. Did you hear it? Anything that is about to be yoked is preparing for work, not rest. There's an expectation of a pace and an exertion. And the only thing that will find rest is the soul, which will be relieved of doubts and anxieties. The second time the word is used is when Jesus enters Jerusalem riding a donkey. He knows he is about to confront a world power and put his life in danger. Quoting the Old Testament prophecy, Matthew says, See, your king comes to you, prouse, and riding on a donkey. Both of these incidents point to an active and fierce trust in God. Reverend Del Monte and the other priests complain that they cannot get closer, that the last touch the faithful feel is a gloved one that the last face they see is often on a screen, yet such sacrifices have not deterred many other priests from ministering to the sick. We use phones and social media to console, he says. We put on masks and other protective gear to visit our people who are fearing death alone. You choose this life to be useful to others, he said. And with the disciples, we ask, now what, Jesus? When will we see you again? How will we know you are still alive? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The invitation today is to allow Jesus to teach us. In these days ahead, let us discover that we are in the presence of the living Christ. We are blessed when we love enough to become poor in spirit. We are blessed when we care enough to mourn for the world around us. And we are blessed when we trust enough to boldly work alongside of a meek Jesus. For in this blessing comes the knowledge that in a unique and profound way, Christ is indeed alive. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, Amen. Today I'm going to say a word about Easter, the song that was sung between the scripture readings this morning. It's a beautiful marriage of poetry from the 17th century by George Herbert and music, expressive music by Vaughan Williams, a great composer of the 20th century. It's one of five songs written in 1911 
you may know the fourth song, which is one that's more commonly extracted from the cycle called The Call. Come, my way, my truth, my life. And the song today is the opening song of this cycle, Easter. The message of the poem is essentially that music is the most effective vehicle of praise. And the, uh, the theme of this poetry is also seen in the Psalms, especially in Psalm 57, verses 7 through 9. My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory, awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. I pray that we can continue to sing and to praise God during these difficult times, remembering that indeed we are all blessed. Every month, the Mayflower Church family leans upon the generosity of members and friends to fund our budget with approximately $25,000 of weekly support through offerings and checks and credit cards and giving online. These are challenging times. Know that your moderator, your vice moderator, treasurer, as well as committee members are establishing a streamlined COVID-19 budget to sustain us in the days ahead. Know that you can give online at our homepage on our website where you'll find a donate button. We have a special mailbox under the portico. And we now offer the opportunity to give via text. Please check your worship bulletin in your email or on our homepage for details as to the number to use to give through your phone. To worship is to be reminded from whom all blessings do flow. And while our ushers might not physically wait upon us this morning, know that your church does ask for your support to continue to serve our membership, our friends, and our community in the name of the risen Christ.
Let us join our hearts together in prayer. We know, O Lord, as St. Paul writes, how you love it when the giver delights in the giving. So, O God of grace, it is our delight and our devotion to return these gifts to you. In worship, we remember that all we are and all we have are yours alone, and it is all a gift. Accept this joyful offering, we pray, as an expression of our love, our adoration. Use it, we pray, to bring peace and justice, healing and comfort to all the world. Amen. This morning are adapted from those offered by Brian McLaren, St. Teresa, and those who work at World Vision. So come wherever we might find ourselves this morning, for in and through the Spirit, which binds us as one, let us open ourselves to God so God might dwell in us, and God might hear our thoughts, the anxieties, the hopes, the prayers that rest upon our hearts, and let us pray. O God of the earthquake and angels in clothes that shimmer like lightning, we are reminded today as we attend to your word that blessings do not necessarily follow the logic of our world. While the world believes it is the rich that are blessed, Jesus reminds us it is the poor and those who are poor in spirit that are blessed. And although we might fear death and do all we can to avoid its inevitable arrival, your son teaches in the act of mourning. There are blessings to be found. And while some of us might covet power and seek advantage, your son teaches that to live as your people and Easter people is to know that you bless that which is meek. You align your gaze with the humble, that there is a strength that rises from weakness, that there is a divine logic that you teach, that power is found in vulnerability. So grant us, we pray, that with this teaching in mind, in all things, today and all the days of our lives, we might live with your words guiding us. So nothing will frighten us. Recognizing when we bend our will to your will, we will lack for nothing. And in fact, we will be blessed. So here are silent prayers for new beginnings, for resurrection, as we open ourselves to the beatitude 
and to your teaching from the mountain. Also gather in prayer, O Lord, for all those affected by COVID-19. As more people get sick, as health care workers and first responders are working longer hours with fewer supplies and with more risk. Renew their energy and sustain them on these long shifts. Protect them as they seek to attend to and to heal patients and stand beside those who are now embraced by your loving arms. Inspire researchers and doctors, all those working on tests and vaccines, and guide those who serve in positions of government to offer truth and empathy to all those who are confused and fearful. Be with families adjusting to new realities, new patterns for work and school. Inspire us to choose grace and kindness and meekness as we relate to one another. And most of all, open our eyes to those who are in need, neighbors, our own family, and church family, so we might live into the reality as your saint once proclaimed, that we are yours for you made us. We are yours for you call us. We are yours for you save us. And we are yours for you raise us to new beginnings, to new life as a resurrection people. Hear our prayers. Bless the Lord, my soul, and bless God's holy. invite you to join your voice together with mine and let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Concrete. 
As we stand in the shadow of Easter, we cannot help but ask Jesus, now what? When will we see you again? How will we know that you are still alive? Let us discover that we are in the presence of the living Christ. We are blessed when we love enough to become poor in spirit. We are blessed when we care enough to mourn for the world, and we are blessed when we trust enough to work boldly alongside of a risen Christ. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>